Hello, I'm Colleen Pearl, the Cool Crone, and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for all of your comments on the previous videos, and to my new subscribers, welcome. I'm so glad you could join us today. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the major astrological events for 2021 and how they affect the sign Virgo. You should watch the video for both your rising and sun signs, as both will be very informative. 2021 has a lot happening astrologically, so let's get to it. Hi Virgo, this is your prediction for 2020 using all the major astrological events that I could find. Let's go. All right, so the beginning of the year, New Year's Day, starts out with a stellium in Capricorn and one in Aquarius. So the stellium in Capricorn falls in your fifth house, and that's the house for fun. Now, Virgo, you've had Pluto in your fifth house for a very long time, uh, over 10 years. And Pluto can be kind of a fun squelcher. Uh, so I don't know how you've been having fun the last decade, but Pluto has been dredging up probably every silly thing you've ever done in your life and asking you to re-examine it and say, was it worth it? Um, I'm sure you've learned to live with it by now, but the stellium in, involves not only Pluto, but also uh, Mercury and the Sun. So at least for the beginning of 2021, you'll have some fun. You'll have a little a little attention from loved ones and you'll have, um, you know, you'll be good at telling jokes that uh, for a few days and you'll enjoy yourself. So remind yourself that this is fun. This is what fun looks like and feels like and reward yourself just a little bit. Then you will have the um, or still on New Year's Day, you have Jupiter and Saturn in your sixth house. And this is going to put the focus on you, the people you work with, the job that you do, not necessarily your career part of the job, but just the actual nuts and bolts of the job, as well as health and your own health care and pets, amazingly. So with Saturn and Jupiter there, that's kind of a wacky combo. So Saturn contracts things and Jupiter expands things. So it could be that your job duties have expanded or maybe your staff has expanded if you manage people or maybe um, the staff has contracted but your duties have expanded so something has been uh, contracting in your work life and something has been expanding in your work life and that's going to continue probably for a good portion of 2021. Um, then we have um, mid-month on the 14th, we have um, a crescent moon in Aquarius, and that's going to highlight that job situation. So it could be that you're getting to know your coworkers a little better, or it could be that one particular coworker um, really needs, needs you or needs your assistance. Um, but you'll have some kind of a personal focus, focus point um, on the 14th or 15th, having to do with either your health, health care, your pets, your job, and the people you work with at your job. Then on, also on the 14th, Uranus goes direct. Now when the very large planets go retrograde or direct, it's a little different than say Mercury or Venus going retrograde. So the big planets, when they go retrograde, it's sort of like they go to sleep a little bit. Not all of their power and, and abilities just stop or get messed up or reverse. No, not at all. They just kind of reduce the power that they give off. And then when they go direct, they get a big push in whatever thing it is that they do. So Uranus is the... Um, agent of chaos you know it's eccentricity it's the unusual it's the unpredictable it's the big surprise it can be an explosion too so when uranus goes direct on the 14th of january you're going to know it something is going to change there's going to be an event of some kind now two days later mars conjuncts uranus so it steps up right beside uranus in the sky and Mars can also be explosions like uh, an exploding firebomb or something, you know. So Mars rules things like 
bombs, knives, guns, weapons. And Uranus is big weather events, natural disasters. Uh, and it's in the sign of Taurus, which is an earth sign. So there could be something on the, on the, on the scale of a natural disaster that happens at this time. Or there could be um, something in your, or there could also be in your personal life, um, some kind of a explosion, as it were, or a natural disaster of a more mundane, more personal type that happens to you. Either way, you're going to feel a big push from the Mars-Uranus conjunction and also just Mars going direct. Whatever is happening between January 14th, 15th, 16th, there's going to be something definite that pushes things out, that has an explosion of energy in some direction and most likely having to do with, um, with your ninth house, which has to do with foreign affairs, foreign cultures, foreign languages, philosophy, religion, the legal system. Um, so something in that area is going to kind of explode uh, in mid-January for you. Now, um, that's it for the middle of January. At the end of January, the end of January, we have Mercury going retrograde for the first time in the year in the sign Aquarius. And Aquarius is hitting your sixth house for work also. So you'll notice throughout the year, there is a big emphasis on this house. Um, so Mercury retrograde in your house for work means that, oh, maybe you'll forget people's names. Maybe you'll forget to get coffee. Maybe you'll spill coffee. Maybe you'll uh, forget your passwords to your computer at work. Maybe you'll, maybe your computer will, um, you know, maybe the hard drive will go or something. So make sure your computer's backed up. Make sure you know all of your passwords. Make sure you have an extra set of keys somewhere. Uh, give yourself an employee list so you don't forget anybody's names. These are the things you should do to get ready for Mercury retrograde on the job. Um, it also could be that with this emphasis on the sixth house, that you also have tried to implement some new healthcare routines or exercise routines or meditation routine or something to improve your health. And those things too might get a little mixed up during Mercury retrograde, but not necessarily totally dropped but just mixed up. So that's another possibility uh, for the effect of this Mercury retrograde. Um, on the 11th of February, we have a new moon in Aquarius also affecting your sixth house. So again, it's going to put a big spotlight on those things as if to say, don't forget, you said you were going to do these things and now here we are. And the moon sometimes really puts things out there for other people to see. So don't be surprised if you're getting comments from other people about these things. On the 17th, we have our first Saturn Uranus square of the year. And I believe this happens several times during the year. I think it's three, but um, definitely it's happening now. And this is going to impact um, your, let's see, this is going to impact your ninth house to your sixth house. And that's another theme throughout the year, this ninth house, sixth house um, square of planets is going to be really uh, honestly kind of annoying all year. So somehow it's going to bring about a very tense situation that comes to a head that has to be resolved in some way. It becomes so uncomfortable and it's so agitating to you that you have to take action in some way. Now this will be a Sagittarius, I mean a, a Saturn impulse on the job uh, healthcare front and a impulse to break out, to be free, to change things up, to, to be erratic, to, to, you know, take apart the foundation um, on the Uranus side. So that uh, those two energies really don't go together. And so you can see how it would be very agitating and how it would almost force you to action. Uh, then we have on the 27th of the month, we have Pluto trine Mars. Mars will be, let's see, Mars will be in Taurus. It's past Uranus. It's no longer connected to Uranus. And it will be trining Pluto, which will be in your um, fifth house, the, the house for fun, remember? Uh, so your fifth house to your... Um, uh, ninth house. 
So again, you're just you've you've got some great energy there. This might be the energy that helps you to take action to resolve this issue. But that Saturn Uranus square is coming back two more times in the year. So it won't be totally put to bed. But you are dealing with the power of Pluto. Pluto has tremendous power. It's the most powerful planet in the zodiac. So if any planet can bring about some kind of a resolution, it would be Pluto. With Mars, it's a little warlike, it's a little violent, it's a little gangster-like. So I would be careful of that kind of resolution, but maybe it's something to put forward and allow it to be refined throughout the year so that you have a less violent resolution to the whole thing, but you do get a resolution. All right. So now on to March. In March, we start out the month with a very nice conjunction between the Sun and Neptune. The Sun is your heart, but it's traveling around the zodiac, right? So right now it's opposite your Sun if you are a Virgo Sun. If you're a Virgo rising, then this just puts the Sun in your seventh house. If you're a Virgo rising, then Neptune has been in your seventh house for a very long time. And Neptune is fantasy, it's illusion, it's uh, creativity, it's spirituality, it's, um, it's the great dissolver. So I would venture to say that relationships with you for the last five years or so um, have not lasted because Neptune would have dissolved them probably, unless your partner is very tuned in to that Neptunian energy and that's the kind of relationship that you want. Or it could be that your big relationship um, or partnership, it could be a business partnership, not just a romantic partnership, um, uses that, has that very Neptunian quality to it. Like if it's a business partnership, is the is the business partner a very Neptunian kind of person. Do they look like a fish? Do they like fish? Do they swim a lot? Do, is the business have to do with anything aquatic whatsoever? Uh, is your logo in ocean colors? I mean, there could be a lot of references to Neptune in that partnership. If it's a romantic partnership, then is the person a Pisces? You know, is the person got a connection that has to do with the sign Pisces? That could be as well. So, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that the relationship has to dissolve, but Neptune is the great dissolver. Now, a few days after that conjunction between the Sun and Neptune, we have um, Venus conjuncting Neptune. So is this somebody new coming into your relationship? Is this um, maybe a child of your of your new partner or maybe your existing partner? Maybe all of a sudden out of the blue, um, she has a child that like, walks out of the woods and says, hey, I'm your child. And you didn't know that for 10 years. Um, there's some kind of female energy connecting with the Neptunian energy around mid-March that is going to be very enjoyable. So even if the relationship has been um, kind of going, kind of fading away, uh, this would bounce, this would bring it back. As long as that's the kind of relationship that you want. It's a Neptunian relationship. It's going to be very fluid. Maybe the um, commitment to the relationship is very fluid. Maybe it's an open relationship of some kind or a different kind of relationship in a way maybe it's very secretive Neptune could also be very very secretive in the in the uh, uh, terms of the relationship just a couple of um, ideas throwing them out there and then at the end of the month Venus moves past Neptune and moves into Aries where it's going to meet up with the planet Chiron now Chiron is a very interesting planet it's a dwarf planet or asteroid and Chiron was discovered in the mid 80s, just about the time that our country was just kind of starting to absorb the fact that people with addictions were not bad people, but they had an illness, they had a disease. Now, AA had been around for decades and people had been seeking out treatment with AA, but now we started to see people getting treatments and, and having it be more acceptable that people could be treated in a more medical-like setting, but therapeutic setting. And what Chiron is, 
is it is the place in our chart where we have a wound or a trauma. And very often people who happen to suffer from addictions of some kind, very often they do have traumas in their lives. Um, I think most of us actually have traumas in our life. So what Chiron shows us is where we, where we have had a wound or a trauma in our life in childhood or even up to early adulthood and where we need to heal. So what Venus connecting to Chiron means is that a tremendous amount of love and feminine energy is going to pour into this um, planet for healing. So it's a good opportunity both for women in general to try to heal and connect with that energy, but people who are connecting to that degree in Aries, people who are just connecting in their house of healing, and healing can take place in numerous houses like the 6th house, the 8th house, the ninth house, the 12th house, are all big houses for healing, the 1st house, big places where you can, where you can transform and heal. Now, some more about Chiron. Chiron is um, also known as the Rainbow Bridge. It orbits around Uranus and then around Saturn, and it goes in an elliptical pattern. So very often it is retrograde. But the retrograde motion of Chiron is not detrimental. It's just it's part of its normal orbit. And Chiron is it's the Christ center of us in our chart. It's where we can really open up to our own spiritual our own divinity not just spirituality it's where we open to our own divinity and so chiron is a very powerful point in one's chart but if you've had a trauma and you've not addressed the the wound of that trauma it can hold you back it can stop you from being a hundred percent of who you really can be and what chiron wants you to do is to dig out that wound look at it heal from it, and then you'll have the ability to heal others as well. So it's very important to look into your Chiron if you want to be, you know, a fully realized person. And the healing that's taking place with Venus connecting to Chiron on March 28th is very powerful. All right, that brings us up to mid-May. So on May 14th, Jupiter is going into Pisces. It has finally moved through all the things in Aquarius, and now it's in Pisces. So our country will feel a big shift when that happens because uh, Jupiter with Saturn and Aquarius had been bringing about a lot of change, a lot of change. And some of it probably is going to be uncomfortable for our country, but very necessary. Once Jupiter goes into Pisces, I feel that people in the country will begin to relax a little bit and feel like they can trust the government, they can trust that uh, the the governments on everywhere from the municipal level up to the White House are trustworthy and that they have our best interests at heart. And that's going to be really a nice change. That's May 14th. On a personal note for you, that's going to be Jupiter going into your seventh house. And that's going to mean that your relationship expands. So where it had been super secretive before, maybe it becomes less so. Maybe it's a little more public. Where it had been uh, something you didn't quite understand, maybe you gain clarity. So Jupiter in Pisces is going to be a real revelation for your relationship. Um, then at the, end, at the end of the month, we go into eclipse season. On May 26th, we will have the first eclipse of the year, which is going to take place in Sagittarius at 5 degrees 26 minutes. So this is going to take place in your fourth house for your domestic situation. So there could be a big change up to your domestic situation coming. If you were born at the, or your rising sign rather, is at the early degrees from 1 to 10 degrees of um, Virgo, then you're going to feel this um, eclipse very, very much. If you're a sun in Virgo and you have your sun in Virgo, you're the first uh, 10 days or so of Virgo, you're going to feel this eclipse a great deal. Um, then uh, on the end of the, at the end of the month, on the 29th, uh, Mercury again retrogrades, this time in the sign Gemini. And I just want to say a word about this. So Gemini is one of the signs that Mercury rules. And you, with Virgo rising or Virgo sun, 
that's the other sign that Mercury rules. So I'm guessing that this particular Mercury rising is or Mercury retrograde is just not going to be too difficult for you. I could be wrong. It could really land on some particularly sensitive spot in your chart and wreak havoc in your life. But for a lot of people who have a strong Mercury or a Mercury retrograde in their natal chart, Mercury retrogrades don't usually bother them in particular signs. Usually everybody gets bothered by a Mercury retrograde at some point in, in, the, in the cycle because Mercury changes, it goes all around the zodiac, and it, but usually each year Mercury is in a particular element. And this year it's air. So this is going to hit your um, 10th house. So this is going to have to do with your career. So while you have um, Venus up there in your 10th house at the same time that Mercury is going retrograde, you could be experiencing some rewards or accolades or a great deal of positive attention having to do with your career. Then Mercury retrograde comes along and all of a sudden you're spilling coffee on your boss and mispronouncing their last name. So <laughs> I'm sure he'll be, he or she will be very forgiving for that faux pas um, because the Venus is there in the 10th house. But if I were you, I would be very careful with this just in case this is a rough Mercury retrograde for you. I would make sure that your computer is backed up, that you have an extra set of keys somewhere that you know how to get to, that you have a list of your passwords with you so you don't get locked out of things, and that you're just generally careful and don't sign any contracts or try to transfer any titles or, um, you know, purchase some large electronic app, uh, appliance like a refrigerator or a computer while Mercury is retrograde. And it's only going to be Mercury retrograde until June 22nd. So that's only three weeks. Just hang in there. Um, then we come to June, June 10th, we have the answering eclipse to the May 26th lunar eclipse. This is June 10th. We have a solar eclipse at 19 degrees Gemini, 47 minutes. Now, this eclipse is also going to focus on your career, and this is going to bring about big change and tremendous solar energy pointed at your career. So now Mercury is still retrograde on the 10th. So it's not going to just make everything magical happen overnight. You have to wait for Mercury to go direct on the 22nd. But you might be given information or you might decide to make changes as a result of this eclipse happening in your 10th house. And don't forget that um, Venus had just been there. Now, by the time the solar eclipse happens, Venus has gone on to your 11th house. But interestingly enough, the sun now is in and... Um, yeah, the sun and the moon, because it's an eclipse, are in your 10th house. So bonus time for you when it comes to your career. This is a great time to try to make strides, to try to make advancements, to try to get not necessarily a raise, maybe a promotion though, maybe a completely different title. If you wanted to make a job change, you would have, of course, done a lot of the preparation well before this June 10th date. But knowing that this is coming, this would be an excellent time to make a change in your career. Then on the 14th, we have Saturn squaring Uranus again. So just go back in the, um, in the video and listen to what we talked about the, the uh, first time that Saturn squared Uranus. It was um, difficult. It's, it's not, um, not real, real happy time, but it is what you have to deal with. It's having to do with your sixth house and your ninth house. So it's something that you have to deal with. Again, there's that agitation that's going to force you into action. Um, on the 21st, Jupiter retrogrades. So Jupiter just went into Pisces on May 14th, and now June 21st, it's going to retrograde and start going back over where what it was in Pisces and in, back into Aquarius. So little reprieve, the country gets to feel all warm and fuzzy about their government, and then... On, uh, June 4, on June 21st, we begin to realize that there's just so much more to do because Aquarius is bringing about change in our leaders. But for you, having uh, Jupiter go back to Aquarius, this is just re-emphasizing things that you needed to do pertaining to 
your health, the sixth house with people you work with, with the way you do your job, with your responsibilities, maybe something to do with your pets. Um, and that's going to expand whatever is going on in those areas. So you may have more responsibilities to, to take care of, but you can handle them or your staff may be increasing for some reason. Okay. So um, then on the 22nd, Mercury goes direct. So that's when all the stuff with your career can just boom, go forward once Mercury goes direct. And you know, um, there's always a shadow period before and after Mercury goes direct. But if you worry about all of those little itty bitty, you know, things going on, you would be sort of trapped and paralyzed by the idea of Mercury retrograde all year long. And like I said, if you are a Virgo rising and you have... Um, you know, other things in Gemini going on in your chart, then you're very tuned in to the Mercury energy and the Mercury retrogrades just might not be that bad for you, especially this year. So keep an open mind, keep a positive mind. Well, this one, the Mercury in Gemini retrograde might not be too bad for you as Virgo rising. Okay, then we come up to July 1st. There's only one real big thing that I want to talk about for July 1st. That is the fact that Mars is opposing Saturn. Mars is in Leo. Saturn is, is in Aquarius in your sixth house. And this is going to be a standoff. So Mars in Leo is hitting your 12th house, which is your subconscious. It's the house for self-sabotage. So make sure that you're not doing anything to sabotage yourself, you know. Um, and we're not talking about Mercury retrograde kind of sabotage here. We're talking about really hurting yourself in any appreciable way. Hurting being the operative word. Do not hurt yourself. Do not, do, do not feel like you are to blame. Do not beat yourself up mentally and emotionally or, or allow yourself to be beat up by somebody. Really, really examine what's going on in your psyche and don't allow yourself to hurt yourself. Um, the opposition to Saturn is that if you, if you are thinking that you, um, are vulnerable, you may also feel that you're to blame, that you deserve something bad. And I, I don't want you to feel like that. So please, 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 um, be careful during July 1st that you don't self-sabotage. Now on a more global scale or a national scale, this, um, could have to do with, uh, clashes in our government. Um, it could have to do with not military, but but some real big clashes with powers, uh, you know, authorities clashing with one another. It could be authorities clashing with the military, but it could also be um, some sort of sabotage coming from um, overseas from another country. And that's on July 1st. So just look out for that right before our country's birthday. All right, the rest of July, however, is kind of a snooze. August is kind of a snooze. September 27th, so most of September is kind of a snooze, and then we come up to September 27th when Mercury goes retrograde again, this time in Libra. Now, if you're Virgo rising, which is what we're talking about, then the Libra retrograde is going to happen in your second house. So, you know, again, the warning about the keys and things like that all all are in force now. You have to be careful about that and about your computer. Um, if you're okay with that, if you understand how to work with Mercury retrograde, uh, then I'll move on to the other things that are going on. In uh, On October 17th, Jupiter goes direct, and it goes direct in uh, Aquarius. So it's in Aquarius. It's going direct. Where's Aquarius on here? There it is. It's going direct. In Aquarius and it's going to keep going on and by the end of the year it'll get back to Pisces just trust me with this so the next day is when Mercury goes direct so October 17th and 18th I'm thinking that we're gonna get some good news that we're gonna finally hear about something maybe something that we've been waiting to hear about but I think that we're gonna get some good news around that time um, as a country I'm talking about um, you personally, you may also get good news. So because Libra is your second house having to do with resources and values. So if you have been negotiating any sort of a contract or more money or a bonus or something like that, um, it's probably going to come after October 18th. Um, this means too that you've got some focus here on your um, 10th house 
on September 27th, your moon is in the 10th house, which is going to give you some focus on your career. The Mercury goes retrograde in Libra, which is your second house, which is your income, right? So if you are asking for an increase in income or a bonus or something like that, right around the time that Mercury goes retrograde, when the moon is in the 10th house, you're not going to hear about it. You're not going to hear about it until Mercury goes retrograde and then you have Jupiter going direct. I mean, until Mercury goes direct and Jupiter goes direct. You're not going to hear about it until Jupiter and Mercury go direct on October 17th and 18th, respectively. So just saying, don't give up hope. Okay. All right. Then we come to November 15th. Now, November 15th, we have a square from Mars in Scorpio, I mean, not a square, an opposition from Mars in Scorpio to Uranus in Taurus. And this is one that I worry about because Mars in Scorpio is very militar militaristic and can be very violent. So um, Uranus in Taurus, that may have something to do with either a natural disaster involving the Earth, like an earthquake, um, or a mudslide or something like that. Not so much a water event, although Scorpio is water, so it could it could be a water event. Um, but Mars in Scorpio can be violent, militaristic, um, sabotage, um, you know, shady, stab you in the back kind of energy. And Uranus is just unpredictable. So you, we just don't know what it's going to involve. But Uranus very often involves large weather events, natural disasters, and both of these things can affect and displace thousands of people and even kill people. Um, and Uranus just in general um, acts as a disruptor. It is the great disruptor. It changes things. It moves things around in ways that are unexpected, unexpected and also ways that make you very uncomfortable. So I worry about this event on November 15th. It just makes me very uncomfortable. Now, how does it affect you? So Scorpio for you is the third house and it's uh, opposing Uranus up there in your ninth house. So probably this will express for you that you are trying to push out your ideas and they're being either rejected or they're being, or they're being um, taken in a weird way. So if you're trying to write a book or do a blog or put something out on the internet or, or you write for some sort of a, pub, a published paper or something like that, that things are just not taken the way you intend them to be. So if it is something that's being published, especially for the first time, I would say that's not the day to do it. November 15th should not be your, your published date because it's going to be misconstrued. It's going to be taken out of context. It's going to be it's going to cause a problem is what it's going to do. So don't put it out there at that time. Just wait. Either do it in October after Mercury goes direct or do it in December. Now, we also have a pair of eclipses around this time. On the 19th of November, we have a lunar eclipse in Taurus. It's the only one in an Earth sign this year. And so that's going to hit your ninth house right on top of that Uranus that just had the opposition with Mars. So careful, careful. Um, you may want to try to take advantage of that energy, but be careful because Uranus is very unpredictable. It's like riding a bucking bronco. Like you don't know which way it's going to twist and turn. Um, and so something is going to come to a close with that lunar eclipse. And then on December 4th, Something's going to come to a head and begin. That's the solar eclipse in Sagittarius at 12 degrees. And this is where you are going to have some kind of a change to your domestic situation. Now, if you're Virgo rising and you have um, uh, your rising sign between, I'd say, 8 and 16 or 17 degrees of Sagittarius, this solar eclipse is going to affect you a lot. If it's not in those degrees, it's probably not going to affect you that much. Um, the lunar eclipse at 27 degrees uh, Taurus. If you have um, if you have a Virgo rising and it's at um, the late degrees of Virgo, say from 24 degrees 
all the way up actually to a couple degrees in Libra, you will be affected by the lunar eclipse greatly, and that will involve um, the Uranus energy. Not a lot, but it will kind of be unpredictable Well, because Uranus will put its two cents worth in. All right, now we come to the last chart of the year, which is um, December 24th, Christmas Eve 2021. And on that day, we have the third and final square between Saturn in Aquarius and Uranus in Taurus. So Uranus in Taurus is going to be your ninth house. Um, Saturn in Aquarius is going to be your sixth house. And so it's going to involve the same thing that the other squares involved. However, I will say that things may have evolved. And, and so things may be moving. You know, these, this series of squares may be helping you to move things along having to do with your work until it finally culminates. Um, prob probably not 2021 is not the culmination. I haven't looked ahead to 2022 to see what all happens between Saturn and Uranus. But when these conclude, that's when we're going to have the culmination. Um, then we have at the very, almost the end of the year, that on uh, December 30th, we have Jupiter going into Pisces. And this is, again, a return to that feeling that, oh, we can trust what's going on because we feel like we're being taken care of. We feel like the government is compassionate and they're not big brother, but they're dad, you know, and they're, it's Uncle Joe, you know, it's dad. They're taking care of us. And that's when uh, we begin to relax and feel like we can really trust what's going on with our government and with the people who are making decisions that impact our lives. So that's the uh, 2021 predictions for you, Virgo. I'm so glad that you uh, listened all the way to the end of the video. I hope it was helpful. I hope you will leave me a few comments down below and let me know how this prediction hit you. And check back with the video through 2021 and let me know how things really played out for the predictions that I made. That's very interesting to me to hear how these things affect you in your real life. Um, I would love that. Thank you so much for subscribing. Be sure you hit the uh, notification bell so you don't miss any other videos. Be sure that you like the video. That's always very, very helpful. And right here is my uh, contact information, my website, which will tell you all of the services that I offer, my email address if you want to get in touch with me directly. And um, I'm very glad that you are here and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Happy 2021, Virgo.